BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. And hello everybody, today is Friday, another Cooper Friday. Welcome to the show, how's everybody doing? On Fridays this year, I've been talking to you guys about D.B. Cooper, the man responsible for the only unsolved skyjacking in U.S. aviation history. And in this episode, I will be revisiting a story that was shared by former UFC and MMA fighter Chael Sonnen. Now, some of you will will remember that I did a part one to this on a previous episode of Cooper Friday about two months ago. And I would like to give a shout out to Lehman, who originally suggested this for an episode of Black Box Online Radio, or at the very least he suggested that I look into this story more about how former UFC fighter Chil Sonnen claims to know the identity of D.P. Cooper, that he was not only a family friend, but his sister's godfather. And I had the opportunity to talk to Lehman by phone, and we were discussing this, and Lehman also claims that he has identified Chael Sonnen's suspect because of several different clues. I mean, I want to be fair to Lehman, so I'll call him a historian. I'm tempted to call him a sports historian because that is one area that he focuses on, but he does other things. He is currently writing a paper about Ed Gein, Ed Gein the serial killer. And one thing, though, that he does specialize in is sports history, and Chael Sonnen dropped certain clues about his suspect and the sports that he played back when he was at school, and Lehman was able to trace back to a particular individual. And I'm going to play some clips from Chael Sonnen here, and he's going to talk about his D.B. Cooper suspect, and it's going to be a little bit lengthy. It's about eight minutes long, and they're going to come from two different places. One of them is from his personal YouTube channel, and the other one is from KFC Radio Clips, which looks like it is connected to Barstool Sports. But I want to preface this by saying that D.B. Cooper boarded a plane on November 24th of 1971. He skyjacked the plane. He handed a note to a stewardess named Florence Schaffner that said that he had a bomb. And yes, lots of events take place in between that, but He more or less tells her that he has the bomb. He demands $200,000 and four parachutes as a form of ransom. The 36-minute flight from Portland to Seattle actually took over two hours. Once the people were off the plane, by the people I mean the passengers, a different stewardess, Tina Mucklow, went and retrieved the money and the parachutes and then brought them back onto the plane. Then the plane takes off. And they're headed toward Mexico City, but the plane didn't have enough fuel to get to Mexico City. So D.B. Cooper agreed to fly to Reno, Nevada. But somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, D.B. Cooper parachuted out into the night, never to be seen or heard from again, to the best of everybody's satisfaction. There are going to be people out there like Chael Sonnen who claim that they know who D.B. Cooper is because of family stories, because of certain personal connections, and as Chael is even going to say by his own admission, there are lots of people who claim that they've identified D.B. Cooper. And I also want to provide a little bit of background info in case you didn't hear my part one on Chael Sonnen's suspect, that he obtained this information about the identity of D.B. Cooper because of personal interactions with this person, his sister's godfather, and it was at dinner or lunch one day, and somebody actually accused him directly of being D.B. Cooper, and then he turned around, and then he shared his story with, um, by he, I mean, the suspect turned around and shared the story with Chael Sonnen's father about how maybe, maybe there's a little bit more truth to that. He said the FBI was looking into him for something. So, again, I'm going to play these clips from Chael Sonnen talking about his D.B. Cooper suspect, and then I will respond. Or, But I, I, I can't not bring it up. Sure. We gotta talk DB Cooper. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm into that kind of stuff. Whether you call it true crime or conspiracy theories and mysteries and all that, I'm big into it. Uh, and so you know, you say you know who DB Cooper. Oh, yeah. was right. Uh-huh. Yeah, he died. Yeah. yeah. Um. To to the extent that the FBI has spoken to you, is no. that true? No. I thought yeah. I saw a, a YouTube that said like the FBI reached out to me about. 
Okay, there's some truth. Y- yes, but 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 hold that. I got a phone call, and I, but I think I might have been catfished. I got a phone call from okay. somebody that said they're with the FBI. But got they it, told, got it. They see. told me the unit that we used to work on. They said, "Chael, just so you understand, nobody's ever going to call you. There was only two of us to start with. We've both long left. There there was no open file on DB Cooper, because I always thought it was a little weird. That the FBI wasn't contacting me. I mean, I'm out. I wrote a book about it. Yeah, and I've given a number of details as well, but they're details that nobody else has given. For they were from a very small town. Like the graduating class was of like thirteen or fifteen. It was really yeah, small everybody town. Everybody knew each other. They hadn't even seen an airplane, let alone been on an airplane. Mm-hmm. And this was a very close friend of theirs. And it turned out he was taking skydiving lessons. So they didn't even know that anyone in this hometown had seen an airplane, let alone traveled somewhere. He's taking skydiving and didn't tell his friends. I mean, that would have been where's huge that kind news. of shit going down though? If he's in such a small town, yeah, it went down in Aurora was the name of the airport. I and mean, there's an airport. And there's places you could do it. You mm. you would just think that you would you would share that with your friends. I have a pretty exciting life and if i would jump from an airplane i would find a way to mention that to you like yeah especially yeah yeah right, friends. right like right. that's a really but exciting you thing were, to do and you know, he planning did planning a heist yeah and so wouldn't. it came out and they found a photo and then they had to go back and ask him and he kind of tried to downplay and they're like this is unbelievable he's you know he's jumping from airplanes and he's not telling anybody that he's doing it and then and then a number of years later this happens the picture comes out it looks like him so when my aunt asked and he said that it wasn't him um uh, he then came to my uncle's house a few days later, and he said, hey, about dinner, about what Paul had asked me. He said, you know, she's not the only one. The FBI's been in my house, so mm. keep it down. I'm leaving town. And he did. He yeah, left. Yeah. He went to Arizona for about seven and a half years. Now, right now on a federal charge, so what, you're in Arizona versus Oregon. But there, there was a different time, man. The 70s was a very different time. Sure. You, you could rob a bank, move two towns away, and they'd never you. you. D.B. Cooper. You know, guys, I get asked about this every so many years. So a number of years ago, roughly 2012, I wrote a book, and when I wrote the book, the gentleman who was the publisher, Arish was his name, great guy, a relationship over the phone, and he called me and said, hey man, this thing's all about MMA. And I had pieces on walkout music, and I was breaking out, yeah, this is how you weigh in, and here's some of the great matches, he said, it's all about MMA. What else do you got? You got to give me something, like this is, this is the MMA book. I was featured. You know, this is Chael's book. What do you got that's Chael? And I said, well, the most interesting I, thing I have that nobody knows, I know who D.B. Cooper is. So I end up writing this in the book. Now, okay, so what? I know D.B. Cooper. Okay, so what? Well, no, that turned out to be a big deal. People were very interested in, well, what do you mean that you know D.B. Cooper? So every time something comes out on D.B. Cooper, which is every few years, I get asked about that. Now, a Netflix special just came out that's rotten garbage. Netflix is rotten garbage to start with, but this D.B. Cooper case, and and you have to understand, if you go and spend 15 minutes studying D.B. Cooper, you've wasted 14. And the only reason I say it is there's, there's nothing new that's coming out, but you'll have these new enthusiasts or you'll have these new spy catchers or you'll have this new show like the three-part Netflix special. They're just regurgitating what we've already heard. Now, the reason for that is nobody has the information but the FBI, and nobody lies more than the FBI. Now, to call somebody a liar, to say they lie, that sounds very derogatory, which is not actually my intent for the FBI. They lie. They call it police work. It's 101. Tell the guy this so he th- and try to get this information for him. They call it police work. But I just share with you that they don't tell the truth. Now, if you want to know who D.B. Cooper is and you want to be able to come in and say, no, I know who it is and not you, don't bring something that got published 10 years ago, which is all the Netflix special did. It was just rotten garbage regurgitated. And it's even regurgitated by people with the FBI who've retired from the FBI. They're waiting for you. They're not going to give us any more clues. They told you enough. You either know him or you don't. They could either catch him or they couldn't, unless they came to me. I will tell them two things that they've never revealed to the public. And I only share that because people keep asking me, how was the Netflix, how close was it? It was garbage. Everything they put out that isn't called Dave Chappelle is garbage. But this was no different because all they did is repackage things from the past. Same as if you were to rewind and go watch the last D.B. Cooper thing they put out three years ago, or you go five years before that. It's all the same thing. That's it. And it's just speculating. Like, they had this woman on. She was in episode three. Her last name was Cooper, and she wanted D.B. Cooper to be her uncle. Like, she thought there was something cool, like a Jesse James or a William H. Bonnie-esque, to it having been her uncle, and she comes out, and it's her only in line on Netflix, and she says, well, my uncle, John Doe Cooper, is the only suspect. 
I want to continue to be the guy who knows. But I'll give you more information than you ever got in a three-part Netflix special. Or you got in your last clippings. Or you're going to get with Freedom of Information Act and the FBI is going to slowly leak out to you. I will tell you it's not the guy in the pictures. It's not the guy that went out to be a gay bank robber and they shot him and he's dead. And that's why the DB case closed because they've got them and they never got him. And from Jump Street, when the composite drawing came out, she said from Jump Street, that's not him. That's a terrible drawing. That's not what I described. Now, her biggest problem was complexion. It was a Caucasian male, and she always thought, beneath the hair and the hat and the sunglasses and the fake mustache, she thought it was a Hispanic gentleman. Now, she's close. She's close. The gentleman was Indian. So she had that part wrong, but she's also the only one that had it right and what everybody's running with on the Netflix special, and the one that's going to come out in three years, but it's just not true. It's just not true. And the wooded area that was jumped into, it's 10,000, I'm making, I'm making a 10,000 acres of nothing but trees of government land. But that government land backs to Indian land, which is where the real D.B. Cooper was raised. He hunted there. He lived there every summer for 32 summers. They would spend three months and go into these woods. He knew right where he was. They said he couldn't have made it. Nobody could survive that. Nobody could make it out. Nobody knew that terrain. Unless it was your backyard because you happen to be Indian. It happens to be back to Indian land. These things can all be confirmed. None of these things. Will, you won't get this in the Netflix special. FBI hasn't put this out. I'm sharing with you. That, that's not my big, my big clue that he jumped into land that he knew. My big clue is what he did that so he could get out. Where he was. How he got home by supper. His own wife doesn't know. His wife's back here in Oregon. So I ended up being with his grandson, by the way. I was with his grandson. There's a parade in Oregon. It's called, there's a rodeo. It's called the St. Paul Rodeo. It's like a top four rodeo in the whole country. Very, very big rodeo for whatever that is. But there's a parade that comes along with it. Very small town, but that's where my mother's from. So I've been going to the St. Paul Parade as far back as I have a memory. Now I take my kids to it. And I happen to be standing with one of D.B. Cooper's Ken. So I asked him. I brought up D.B. Cooper. Hey, you seen this thing? It's going around on Netflix. This thing's coming out. D.B. Cooper. Hey, D.B. Cooper. I said it a couple times. I finally looked at him and said, hey, you got any idea why I'm asking you about D.B. Cooper? He said, no, I don't know why you keep saying that name. And I, he didn't know. But the wife also does not know. But I know. And it's just one of those things. It's a little bit weird that I don't get asked. There's nobody with my level of notoriety that's ever come out and made such a claim. But moreover, that has also said, I will talk. I won't give you the name, but I'll give you two pieces of evidence that the FBI has that they've never told you. Nobody's even made those claims. I would look like a fool if I didn't have that, but I do have it. And I'm waiting for you to ask me politely and perhaps absent of the name, I will tell you. And one more time, those were the words of Chael Sonnen on his personal YouTube channel, which is just called Chael Sonnen and KFC Radio Clips. When I did a Cooper Friday segment months ago on the suspect, Joe Lackage, who is the D.B. Cooper suspect of Bill Rollins, what I said was, I have never been so conflicted in all of Black Box Online Radio. There are almost 2,000 episodes of Black Box Online Radio now, and you can hit the like button and subscribe if you want to follow along with things like Cooper Friday. I also talk about the Zodiac Killer and Jack the Ripper. But I had never been so conflicted with someone's presentation where I'm hearing, hey, wow, what a really good point. And then I'm hearing, hey, wow, what a crackpot point. And I think Chael Sonnen has given him a run for his money. I mean, in those clips that you just heard right there, I hear a lot of good points and I hear a lot of bad points. The first um, good point is that Chael Sonnen is talking about how Netflix is not very reliable. I could not agree more. I think that that's a hundred percent true. And I say this because Netflix is a streaming service and there are other studios out there that aren't exclusively related to streaming. 
But when something is as big as Netflix is, is, it becomes all about the money. Netflix is done for profit. Multiple times I've been interacting with someone and they share something about how there was this true crime documentary that was supposed to come out on Netflix, a multi-part series, maybe even with another studio, and it got shelved. It got canceled. They decided not to release it because it just wasn't the right time. And they're also holding back on things because they want to wait and see what happens with the investigations. And they're going to choose which documentary they're going to release, which miniseries that they're going to release. So when this thing about Netflix being garbage is completely done for profit, it's completely done for exposure. However, it does share these stories with a very wide amount of people. It's a gift and a curse, I would say, but I do think that Chael's criticisms of Netflix are somewhat accurate. The thing that I'm just so completely bothered by is this person claims that he can solve this mystery. This person claims that he knows the identity of D.P. Cooper and he's just not going to reveal it. He could be like some of these other people that he's criticizing. He could have a suspect. He could tell you the reasons why he thinks that this person was D.B. Cooper. By his own admission, this person passed away years ago, so you can't libel a dead man. And I think that the biggest reason why somebody like Chael Sonnen would do that is because he is um, afraid of being challenged, or not exactly afraid. He doesn't want his suspect to be scrutinized. He doesn't want a suspect to be put under the microscope, because then people are going to start asking very, very tough questions. Now, I want to do a very small recap from some things that I said in part one about Chael Sonnen's D.B. Cooper suspect. I have to change something. In the first episode that I did on his suspect, I was under the impression that this guy was living in central Washington state. And the reason why I said that was... Of, well, it's because of the geography of the land that D.B. Cooper would have been in Seattle, and he's on the plane, and the plane is flying toward the Oregon border, and that he would have jumped out, parachuted into the night. And as Chael Sonnen says in almost every interview about D.B. Cooper, that his suspect landed on government land, which then fed into Indian land. And to be honest, I'm not extremely familiar with this these types of terminologies, it appears that that actually is just what you will find on a map. The reason why he's just calling it Indian land as opposed to a Native American reservation is on the older maps, it flat out just says Indian land. So credit there to Chael Sonnen. But that would have meant that he would have landed in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, which would have fed into the Yakima Reservation, which is almost northeast of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And the forest is right by the Columbia River, so that could have gone in a direct diagonal line to central Washington, or at the very least, east central Washington. Then, I had this phone conversation with Lehman, who claims that he has identified Chael Sonnen's suspect, and he also shows me about Chael Sonnen's connections to the state of Oregon, how he's from Oregon, how he knows Oregon inside and out, how he talks about attending this parade in Oregon, and... If this guy was living in Oregon, and he's home for supper, as Chael would say by his own admission, everything has changed. There is a complete 180 now for me, metaphorically speaking. It, we'll see about the angle in just a second. What I think Chael is trying to say is, and this is my updated version, D.B. Cooper would have jumped out over the Columbia River, the Columbia River, more or less the border between... Oregon and Washington. He would have been able to do this by estimating the amount of time that he spent in the air. He didn't care about Reno. He didn't care about Mexico City. He didn't care about any of these things. He wanted to jump over the Columbia River. He lands in or around the Columbia. Then he goes into Mount Hood National Forest. And Mount Hood National Forest on the Oregon side is directly almost side by side with a place called the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. Indian land, as Chael Sonnen talks about it in the videos. And he says, though, this is um, something that both him and his father have done to theorize and hypothesize and connect the dots on their own, that this guy, their D.B. Cooper suspect, would have had a motorcycle station somewhere around either the drop zone, the National Forest, and 
maybe even a little bit farther south, and he would have taken a motorcycle to central Oregon where he was living at the time. Okay, this is very, very big because I said in part one that the only thing I thought this theory had going for it was that Chael Sonnen's suspect was um, matching up with the geography. Like, I could, I could see this because I've said for a very long time, I think D.B. Cooper jumped over Washington State as opposed to Oregon. And when, once I learned that this guy is living in central Oregon, he's using this particular type of escape route, I was a little bit... Um, well, I had to take a step back and think, now, this is a strike against it. I could comprehend how he jumps in southern Washington, gets on the motorcycle, drives through the Yakima Reservation, going to east central Washington. I mean, I can, I can look at how that would work out based on the time frames. And when you look at a lot of estimations that are, say, perhaps done by Ryan Burns and Chris Cunningham over on the D.B. Cooper Sleuth channel, they often point toward... D.B. Cooper jumping over southern Washington. Now, to jump and to have any way to reconcile all of this, I would think that the most logical thing for Chael Sonnen's theory to work would be that he jumps right around the Columbia River, enters the Mount Hood National Forest, gets on the motorcycle, drives through the Warm Spring Indian Reservation, and he's just navigating the whole place. Maybe the motorcycle is even in Warm Springs as opposed to the National Forest. That part doesn't seem to be completely clear. Also, I told you guys, I was talking to Lehman, who claims that he has identified this person, and yes, I do know this person, so in the tradition of Chael Sonnen, I'm not going to tell you because this is just a private citizen who hasn't been publicly identified, and I'm not going to be the first one, and moreover... I'm not the one who discovered this. I'm not the one who connected the dots. Lehman did, so that's his responsibility and his um his choice whether he chooses to share this name publicly. But I was able to do a little bit of searching about the guy, and he would have been 29 years old at the time of the D.B. Cooper skyjacking. 29 is very young. It's not completely impossible, because we have other suspects out there that are very young, such as Richard McCoy was also 29. Robert Rackstraw was even younger. He was 28 years old. And there are a couple other strong points, though, from Chael Sonnen's presentation that tie into this D.B. Cooper theory. And that is that, number one, his suspect apparently did skydiving lessons in secret and he just comes from a small town in the middle of nowhere in Oregon, and he doesn't tell anyone that he's doing skydiving lessons. Some people don't want the attention. Other people do. On a personal level, just thinking about this, I mean, I'm from a small town in West Virginia. I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have told anybody because I wasn't an attention seeker like that. If anything, I would hold something back because I would not want attention if I were doing skydiving lessons or something to that effect. But, I mean, you know, that's we're, we're different people, right? But that's just is something that he is putting forward, that his suspect was doing skydiving lessons in secret and didn't tell anyone. So I would give him that. That is a strong point. And the next thing is something that I shared in part one of his, my episode on his suspect, and that is that he left the state of Oregon after the skyjacking. He thought the FBI was on to him. And in the 1970s, at some point, he goes down to Arizona, and I believe this would have occurred in 77, but don't quote me on that. And he goes down to Arizona, and he stays there for approximately seven and a half, eight years, and it appears that he was going in and out of the state of Arizona because when he passed away a couple of years ago, he also passed away in the state of Arizona, and they also say that he was just purchasing things that it seemed like he didn't have the money for. He was acquiring things that seemed to be very expensive for him, yet he was still somehow able to do it. And that's another strong point. And someone else also brought this to my attention in the comment section. I was talking about how I didn't believe that the Cooper money was spent because it wasn't put into circulation. And what somebody said was, you know, they weren't using computers in the 1970s, and they w weren't always manually looking through books to be on the lookout for certain serial numbers. I mean, it's quite shocking that other than the $5,800 at Tina Bar, that no one has been able to find the money. And, I mean, is, is it possible that D.B. Cooper did actually spend the money? So, that more or less 
is the story surrounding Chael and suspect. And I don't really feel uh, bad about not telling you this guy's name because, number one, I'm not even 100% sure it's the actual guy that he's looking for. And I did contact Chael and He has a website which has an email address that doesn't look like it's going to be monitored by him. It says something to the effect of info at badguysentertainment.com or something, which I would expect would go to a personal assistant of sorts. And then I just wrote to him and I said, hey, I think I know who your suspect is. It's this person for these reasons. And I listed pretty much everything that I've told you in this episode. I have not heard anything back yet. I also invited him to be a guest on Black Box Online Radio. And I've done several other interviews on Cooper Friday with Pat Boland, Stuart McAdam, Ryan Burns, and Darren Schaefer. I did a two-part interview with Ryan Burns actually talking about Richard Floyd McCoy and the D.B. Cooper suspects. I invite you to check that stuff out if you're curious at all about different perspectives on the case. And everybody that I just mentioned has followed the D.B. Cooper case for years, and they do have high understandings of it. And I also don't completely agree with something that Chael, Sh Chael Sonnen said on his YouTube channel, that if you spend 15 minutes reading about D.B. Cooper, you've wasted 14 minutes. No, I mean, because some people might learn some things, and some people might be able to understand the mystery in a different way. And, I mean, I would love to get, just get a response from him some way, somehow, to just acknowledge that maybe I'm going down the right pathway, that Lehman was going down the right pathway of identifying his suspect. But he has stated in multiple places, especially on his own YouTube channel, that he will not reveal the name of this person, even though he has passed away. And again, I think it would be unfair if I just start trying to accuse somebody not of being D.B. Cooper, but of being Chael Sonnen's D.B. Cooper suspect. But, however, let's see where this goes. Maybe that will come to a certain point in the future. I do want to leave you guys with one thing, and that is that Chael Sonnen's audience does not believe this. When I read through the comments on his own YouTube channel, as well as on some of these other interviews, the people whom I can only expect followed him from MMA and UFC just simply say he's a liar. They think he's a troll. And these are his fans, mind you. They just say, he is making this whole thing up. This is all an elaborate ruse that was created by Chael Sonnen. And I said in part one that Chael Sonnen was equally famous for his time in front of the microphone as his time in the ring during uh, my part one episode. But, you know, one, one more time, though, the book that Chael Sonnen has written that includes his D.B. Cooper material is The Voice of Reason. And he has a YouTube channel just called Chael Sonnen, and it seems that he is going to play this game a little bit longer, but he just says that every so often something comes out about D.B. Cooper, and then he just gets asked about it, so he wants to respond to it, and it sounds like he's not a fan of any of the other suspects out there. Now, number one, I believe him. I believe he actually thinks he knows who D.B. Cooper is, and I take that back. I take that back. I believe that these were real stories that were shared in his household, that that part is true. Now, does he actually think that this guy, whom I cannot tell you is his name, is from, is, is D.B. Cooper? That I'm not 100% sure of, because people can have doubts. People can have conflicts about things. They can have emotional conflicts. Well, yeah, I heard this story in my family. I don't know if it's true or false. Oh, I'm just going to act like it's true because it's very beneficial for my exposure. Yeah, okay, something like that. But um, I believe that those stories were shared in his home because he's extremely consistent with that. When he does interviews about D.B. Cooper, his Cooper facts are all over the map, and he just gets things so completely wrong. In, in part one, for example, I shared the clip where he was talking about D.B. Cooper handcuffed himself to one of the stewardesses, and people played that on Facebook, and then they were all just putting him him down for that, saying, no, no, we shouldn't listen to anything this guy says. D.B. Cooper didn't handcuff himself to the stewardess, and no, D.B. Cooper did not do that. As I said, D.B. Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaffner, who put it in her pocket, and neither Florence Schaffner nor Tina Mucklow was handcuffed to D.B. Cooper. Okay, that's a mistake, but I wouldn't discredit somebody's entire theory just because they got one got one fact wrong, and Chael Sonnen isn't even claiming to be a researcher. He's not even claiming to be someone who's done a deep dive into this material. He says that 
this is a family story. This is almost like a guarded family secret that he knows who D.B. Cooper is because of some personal interactions. But uh, yes, I do believe that this is a real story that has been shared in his household. Does he believe it himself? His audience doesn't think so. They think that he's just um, trolling, that he is just um, doing this stuff to create a buzz. And I wish people uh, wouldn't do that, but I mean, that's what they think. And what do you think, though, about this um, new new angle of D.B. Cooper jumping above the Columbia River, then going into the Mount Hood National Forest, and then into the Warm Springs Indian Reservation? And by the way, um, do you know how many national forests are in Oregon? It really is quite shocking that you have the Oregon coast, and then you have almost a solid line of national forests going parallel to the Oregon coast, different national forests. And then from the Mount Hood National Forest, going into the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, taking the motorcycle to his hometown. Now, this is something that I'm going to be more critical of, and I think that he loses points for this, and his theory becomes less and less viable, partnered with if Lehman has actually successfully identified his suspect, 29 years old, also a less viable suspect. I think D.B. Cooper was considerably older, maybe around age 40 as opposed to age 29. What do you guys think? Put your ideas in the comment section down below. One more time, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. You can also go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. That allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And you can visit some of the other episodes that I talked about. My interviews with Pat Bolin, Stuart McAdam, Darren Schaefer, and Ryan Burns. Lots of D.B. Cooper content here on Cooper Friday. That's all for me now. Until next time.